presentation. <clears throat> I want to ask, how many of you have ever seen a USB-powered vegetable chopper? <laughs> so this is one of my first and favorite little creations. It's, this is a real vegetable chopper, or was a real vegetable chopper, but I've done a few things inside of here. And I have this nice little USB cable sticking out of it. And what my USB chopper does, which I have so lovingly dubbed it slide chop, is... <laughs> So if I hold it down, it'll go back. Oh. <laughs> so it gets even better. <laughs> so this is a pretty basic example of some of the fun things that you can do with, you know, household gadgets and electronic bits. So I'm going to yank this out real quick, switch over to the camera and show you this. So what I've got this is a uh, Teensy 3.0 um, board here, microcontroller, processor. Um, it works like an Arduino uh, board, which is a very popular style of hardware to build things in code these days and upload it to your devices and be able to just do basically whatever you want with hardware. Um, Arduino tends to be uh, C-based, although I'm going to show you guys how we can do this with JavaScript as well here in a few minutes. But the ATC 3.0, the advantage that this has, not only in size, but it emulates human input devices. It emulates a mouse, a keyboard, a joystick, all kinds of fun stuff. And so on the back side of this, you can see right here, I have this button mounted. So when I smash down the plunger here on the vegetable chopper, this platform inside of it smashes down the button and my TNC 3.0 literally just does a mouse click. That's all it does. So it's nothing terribly fancy or, or super duper exciting when you get down to how it actually works, but the combination of putting all of these things together creates a pretty, pretty amazing effect of being able to say I have a USB powered vegetable chopper to advance my slides. The code for this is written in C, not in um, JavaScript, though. That's one of the things that I had to sacrifice for putting together the USB-powered slide chop. And my cables are tangled. Give me half a second. Sorry. Thought that was untangled. So I need to actually move that out of the way because, unfortunately, I need my one USB port. Uh, so JavaScript and robots, it's an interesting thing. It's, it's another example of um, Atwood's law in play. And, and Jeff Atwood, coding horror founder, uh, one of the founders of um, Stack Overflow and now Discourse, a couple of years ago said something to the effect of anything that can be built in JavaScript will be built in JavaScript. And we've seen that explode over the last few years. We've seen everything from Node.js on the server to MongoDB with its JavaScript API and JSON-based API to get documents, JSON documents in and out of a database. We see you know, the entire stack of development very heavily moving toward JavaScript and JavaScript-like things. JSON documents have almost replaced XML documents as the de facto way that at least newer systems are communicating and cre creating APIs. We're not dealing with large XML documents anymore. We're dealing with slightly smaller JSON documents. And having JSON parsing capabilities is becoming a necessity no matter what language you're working in these days because chances are you're going to be building something on a front end if you're doing web development where a browser is doing some interaction and you have JavaScript that's creating documents of data that you need to push back to your server. And no matter what that server is, JavaScript needs to be involved because we have JSON documents which are just JavaScript objects in a document notation. So Atwood's Law really is coming true. There are multiple examples of this all around us and a growing and, and very large uh, group of people that are continuing to push the boundaries of what JavaScript can do, including robotics, which is what I'm going to give you some introduction to uh, in this session. And then later today, you're going to want to check out Cassandra Perch's session on technology wearables and, of course, the keynote with Chris Williams on democratizing hardware 
hardware. So you're going to have this amazing journey, starting with me showing you the intro to electronics, a little bit about how it works, what they do, and some of the principles and patterns that we can see in electronics and how it parallels to software development, up to me controlling my nice little robot here that I have uh, using an Xbox controller, using JavaScript command line terminal, and using a leap motion device to control it with gestures. So to get started though, one of the most basic things that you can do with electronics is simply hook up a battery with an LED. And if you have a small enough battery, you'll be able to get some glowing light out of that LED. But more often than not, if you have a battery directly hooked up to an LED, what you end up with is battery to explode because you're going to fry the thing. The LED just can't take power like that without having it regulated. It can't take, you know, five volts of, of power running directly to an LED unless you get a large enough LED that's rated for that kind of power. But typically speaking in small electronic devices like we're dealing with here, we don't have a large enough LED to handle that kind of power. We tend to use LEDs that are smaller, a little more fragile, and so they need to be protected. And one of the most basic things that you can do in electronics to actually maintain the stability of your system is to use LEDs to protect, I'm sorry, use resistors to protect things, including LEDs. Resistors, they resist the electrical flow of, the flow of electrical current. They reduce the amount of power heading to whatever it is that you're talking about. So we can have a resistor protecting an LED and actually have it produce some light. And I'll show you that here on the camera. I've got an Arduino board hooked up really only as a power source at this point. But I have this nice little glowing LED on there that you can see on the, on the breadboard right here. So when I unplug this from the USB power, you can see that it turns off. I plug it back in and it turns on. And it's able to do that because just above the LED right here, and I know it's fuzzy, it's hard to see, but there is a resistor in there that is limiting the amount of power that's heading to the LED. Now one of the interesting things you can do with resistors is not just have a fixed resistor. This is, a, this is fixed resistance. It does not change. But if you add something like a variable resistor, which is this little blue guy right here, then we can do some slightly more interesting things. Give me a half a second to hook this up to the power on the Arduino. And it helps if I plug them into the right ones. And when I turn this on again, we're not going to see much of a glow at this point. It's, it's just barely on, but I can, safety goggles on, but I can start turning this and we can see it gets darker and dimmer and we can see it also gets brighter. Now, what happens if I turn this resistor all the way down? Like I said before, we tend to end up with something really bright and slowly burning out. It's changing. It's actually burning the LED instead of just popping it in this case. You can see the LED is now turning orange. And if I let it go long enough at full power, it'll end up turning burnt red. I can turn it down and I can still get a green light out of there, but the green is not nearly as bright as it used to be, and I have a lower threshold at which it actually turns orange now and starts to burn again. So typically, with these other LEDs that I have, when I plug one of these red LEDs in, they don't typically burn like that. The red LEDs, they, t you know, they glow nicely, but then when you turn the power all the way up, they tend to just, I don't know if you heard that, but there actually was a little, saw smoke. you saw smoke on the screen possibly as well. So if you look at this really closely, which I don't know if my camera will focus appropriately, but I can see that there is a black spot on the LED, on this side of the LED. And that black spot is the LED having actually burnt and popped, hence the safety glasses. Yeah, you can totally smell that. It's nice and burnt. <laughs> so while electronics are fun, 
they are also mildly dangerous at times, and you can do some interesting and dangerous things with them. You tend to need to have appropriately uh, scaled down electricity flowing through your system, which is where uh, resistors come into play. And resistors are one of the most fundamental pieces of uh, technology that you'll have inside of any kind of electronics project, because you need to make sure that you're getting the right amount of electricity to the right place at the right time. But resistors are also useful for other things, not just limiting the amount of current, but actually being able to say, I only want this amount of current at this particular place. So we can use Ohm's law to do some simple calculations and say, hey, I want a schematic that I've got a schematic here, and I want to be able to, to take the voltage input, the V in up there, and I want to have a very specific set of a, a very specific power coming out of it. And we do that using what's commonly called a voltage divider, where we have two resistors in place and we have uh, everything grounded appropriately to create a loop, but then we have some voltage out over here. And a voltage divider is the most common way of getting an exact amount of electricity coming out of um, a particular uh, voltage input source. The way that you calculate this is you know, some nice little simple math there. Not terribly interesting if you're not actually sitting down and working on the real problem. What is more interesting, though, is that two resistors connected to a battery like this is kind of the basics of a voltage divider. I mean, if you looked at that schematic that I just showed and you tried to, tried to build that, well, the only thing that is grounded here is this loop from the voltage in through the two resistors back to ground, which goes back to voltage. And it just kind of runs around in circles there. That's mildly interesting because this is a great way to drain your batteries. All it's going to do is just run electricity round in circles until your batteries are dead. There's not actually any real work, any output coming out of this kind of scenario. You need something else in the mix. You can't just put resistors and wires in place. And you really don't want to take those resistors out of there in this scenario either, because you'll either fry the batteries or melt the wire, which is definitely not a good idea, and I'm not going to demonstrate that. But what you want to do instead is have something like a voltage divider to an LED. And you can do that in order to regulate the amount of power from a larger power source to the LED. So you have a resistor up here, and you have a resistor down here, and you have an LED that's coming out on a line, power line in between those two. And this <coughs> would eventually go to ground somewhere else. And that LED will have power flowing to it um, with a very specific set of uh, specific amount of voltage uh, based on the resistors that you put in place. Now, the math formula that, you, that we have here is not terribly difficult to process. You just take the voltage in, which is typically 5 volts from a USB power. You add the first and second resistors together and then divide that by the second resistor's value. What's interesting about that, I find, is if we have two resistors that, re that have the same amount of resistance, so if, say, we had 10K resistors, which resistors are measured in, in resistance is measured in ohms, uh, named after Ohm for the Ohm's law as well. If we have two resistors at 10K, this math formula gives us half of the voltage as the output. And I find that interesting because if I have two resistors at 1K, well, it ends up being the same thing. If I have two resistors at 333K, two resistors at 50K, it doesn't actually matter what the resistance is if you want to divide the voltage in half. You just need to have resistors that are rated for the voltage input that you have, and you can divide the voltage output in half just by putting in two resistors that are the same size right there. So if you want to go from 5 volts down to 2.5 volts, all you got to do is put in two dirt cheap 1K resistors, or or even lower resistors if you want, and you'll end up getting the output that you desire. So from there, we move into what's called, that, called a pull-down resistor. And a pull-down resistor is a pattern that we use to allow voltage to escape once signal is lost up here. So up here, instead of a resistor, I have a switch a physical little button that you would press, or a light switch, or something that would allow electricity to either flow or stop flowing through this little uh, schematic here. And what happens is, when I have this closed, 
when I have the switch pressed down, electricity flows and it ends up creating a scenario where there is resistance going to ground and we really would need a resistor right here as well. I forgot to put that in place to protect the LED. But we would have electricity flowing to the LED through another resistor to protect the LED. Once we let go of the switch though, an interesting property about electricity is that it doesn't just disappear once you have, once you have, uh, once you have your power source gone. If we opened up this switch and none of this bottom part existed, this line would actually continue to carry a small amount of electricity. There wouldn't be any place for it to go, so it would kind of just stay there. And we tend to end up with false positives in that scenario. We tend to end up with situations where electronics are still operating, even though you think, well, there's no power going to it. How is that power, how is it still getting power? How is it still running? It's because we have charge left over in the line that we're using to run it. So what a pull down resistor does, it says, okay, once this switch is open, well now I still have a route to get all of that electricity back to the ground. So instead of electricity flowing through in this direction, the electricity is now gonna back its way out and it's go down through the resistor here. And it's gonna end up going into ground. The reason we need this resistor here is because we want electricity to flow mostly toward the LED over here. We don't want it all to just go straight to ground. That would just be you know, an open circuit and it, uh, or a short circuit and it would end up just frying everything. We want it to flow this way. The resistor gives it some resistance to make most of the electricity flow, but then once we open that switch, the resistor is the only path to ground and the electricity will flow through to the ground and it will turn off the LED. And I don't have a third breadboard set up to show you that. But you might notice something here as well. The difference between a pull down resistor and a voltage divider is just this one thing right here. We have a switch or we have a resistor. We have something over here, we have something over here. But the names are different because they are intended to do different things. Their purpose is slightly different, more specialized in each case. And in software development, we call that design patterns. This is one of the most common and most important design patterns that you'll see in electronics. The ability to replace whatever this thing is with some kind of resistance is going to give you a whole lot of flexibility in your system designs. Now a switch is an interesting form of resistance because it goes from zero resistance, meaning electricity just flows through, to near infinite resistance because there's no connection being made. So there's no way for electricity to jump across that you know, open air unless you have incredibly high voltage and you want to shoot lightning across the thing, which is a really bad idea in small electronics. So design patterns exist not only in software, but also in hardware. And learning these design patterns is going to be one of the first things that you need to do in order to get into electronics, in order to get into robotics, because you're going to use these kinds of design patterns in order to get things set up appropriately. You're going to take, for example, a barbecue probe that I have right here, and you're going to connect that to a pull down resistor or a voltage divider, however you want to look at it. And you're going to connect it, wire it up. I've got all these wires here for an LCD screen as well. And you can take this barbecue probe and turn it into a um, JavaScript or C powered thermometer that you can use in food. Now I've got my barbecue probe right here. And the end of that barbecue probe is a standard connection for, uh, I think it's 3 30 seconds inch audio input. So I created this little circuit board that has my audio input right here. I bought this at Radio Shack for like $2. And I have various wires set up, including a pull down resistor that I have set up right here on the end. Can't see it very well on the camera, but that's a resistor right there. So what I end up with is an Arduino board down here that has all of the input from my um, uh, barbecue thermometer and then it has output with an LED over here. 
So an interesting thing about this thermometer, this is called a thermistor in technical terms. Not really a very nice term. It's hard to pronounce. But a thermistor is a thermal resistor. So in those diagrams that I just showed you, I can replace that first resistor instead of a switch or instead of just a static resistor, I can put a thermal resistor in place and change the amount of electricity coming out of that voltage divider setup. And as that voltage changes, it's going to give me a different amount of signal that I can use to convert into temperature. So when I plug this in, we don't see a whole lot yet. Just an LED screen powering up. But when I start up Node.js here, running the code, we can see on the screen current temperature 77 degrees. We can see when I put the thermistor in my mouth, oh. yeah, I do have a temperature, right? <laughs> Switch back over to the camera, and again, we get the output. A little cold. A <laughs> little bit. Well, it's, it's slightly off. There's a, there is a variance in every single resistor that is ever manufactured. And you can control that variance to a certain degree. You'll spend more money on a tighter variance than on a, less, than on a, a, a looser variance. And for cooking food, when you're talking about 250 degrees, 150 degrees or whatever, and you're off by one or two degrees, Typically not a big deal, so they don't, they don't put a lot of tight control on the variance on thermistors. Did you have to ground yourself uh, with a common ground to the rest of the board? I probably should. I probably should ground myself. <laughs> but I tend to be one of those people that just kind of pokes my, 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 myself into things and, and see what happens. Um, <laughs> there is a grounding in this setup. It's actually grounded to my laptop right now, which could be potentially dangerous. Because if there was a power surge in the USB side of things, it could backfire and, you know, I mean, it, it could be bad. An interesting thing about LEDs on that front, though, LED stands for light emitting diode. This is a light emitting diode. Well, in electronics, a diode is a one-way door. It only allows electricity to flow one way. That's what a diode does. It helps you prevent backflow of large amounts of electricity. It'll fry the diode, essentially, before it allows the electricity to flow backwards. So an LED, a light emitting diode, also is single directional electricity flow. It can only flow one way. And we typically bend you know, these uh, wires that come out of an LED, like, like I've shown here, which I know is hard to see on the screen, but we tend to bend it into this half fork shape because one of these wires is actually longer than the other. The longer wire is called the anode. That's where the electricity flows in. The shorter one being called the cathode is where the electricity flows out. So if I plug this in backwards in my little breadboards here, it wouldn't do anything. It, would, it might break the LED in a different way than I showed previously, but it probably wouldn't do anything because the electricity wouldn't be able to flow through appropriately. Um, yeah. Did you use some sort of a uh, correction table to correct for the response, or did it have a pretty good linear response for temperatures? Um, I did not use any kind of correction tables on the thermistor. Um, I will get into that code right now, actually. So I want to show you that slide. Just you know, show me the robots. Um, so let's go into this code a little bit. Um, it's quite, quite small, actually. When I look at this code. There's not a whole lot going in here. So this is where we get into Johnny Five and JavaScript powered our, um, robotics and electronics at this point. So Johnny Five is a library that allows you to do serial communication with Arduino and maybe a few other boards. I think Cassandra and Chris can, can tell you if other, what other boards are supported with Johnny Five. Uh, but it, 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 behind the scenes, 
has a library called Node Serial that Chris Williams wrote uh, that co communicates over a serial port, which is really all USB is, universal serial bus. So it allows me to have my code communicating with my Arduino device. And it does so on essentially a run loop. Just every however often it pulls, it runs code, it does things. Uh, Johnny5 will read data off of the Arduino, and then it will push data over to the Arduino. So in my case, for the thermistor, I'm not using any kind of correction table to adjust for things. Um, I'm using a fairly well-known formula to convert the voltage output into Kelvin at first, and then into Celsius, Celsius and Fahrenheit from that. You can get this formula on 20 different websites, Basically, you look up Arduino thermistor, and then you'll end up finding this particular formula in a lot of different places. Uh, what's difficult about this, though, is that you have to know exactly how much resistance this thermistor is capable of producing. If it's capable of producing 0 to 10,000 ohms of resistance, then the pull-down resistor that you put in place for the output of the thermistor has to be a 10K resistor. If you don't have those things matched up, you end up with incorrect results. And so if you put a 100K resistor matched up with a 10K thermistor, you're going to get wildly inaccurate temperature readings, whether, it, whether it's high or low or whatever the case may be. So you do have to pay attention to what resistors are going together. And essentially, you can get bad results if you don't. So Johnny5, now that we've kind of let the cat out of the bag here, is an interesting little process that requires one thing that you have to do inside of C before you can actually use Johnny5. So I've got this code that you can't see very well pulled up inside of the Arduino IDE. The Arduino IDE allows you to write C and C++ and compile that down and send it over to Johnny5. Fortunately, I didn't have to write any of this because my C skills are terrible and this is some rather complex code. But what this code right here is, it's called standard fermata. I don't know what that actually stands for, but what it does is allow serial communication with all of the inputs and outputs on a Arduino device. So you compile and upload the standard fermata over to your Arduino board, and then you're done with the Arduino IDE and C. You don't ever have to get back into there if you don't want to. You can quit out of the Arduino IDE, and you can go start writing JavaScript like I'm showing over here. And when I do that, I start by getting Johnny5 installed in Node.js. And I set up a few interesting things here, including the pins that I have my, LE, my LCD uh, connected to to give the output. Um, after creating the Johnny5 object, the Johnny5 board, I wait for it to be ready before I start reading any of the sensor information. So I have a sensor connected to the pin input that I've configured on my board here and I tell it to read every half a second. And every half a second, it looks for data coming from the Arduino. Anytime there is information that has changed, whether it's you know, going up or down, it's going to fire this sensor change event and allow me to run the calculation to convert voltage into Kelvin and other temperatures, and then be able to produce the output on the screen. So what this is showing is Johnny5 running across a serial port communicating with the Arduino using Node.js. And that's important to understand because Johnny5 requires the serial connection using Node.js. You have to run Node.js somewhere. You can't just have Node.js compiled down to run on the Arduino directly. It doesn't work that way. Uh, Johnny5 is set up to always communicate with serial ports. And it does that typically through USB, but I'll show you here in a few minutes that it can also work over a Bluetooth adapter. This is a specialized Bluetooth adapter that uses serial port communications for its Bluetooth profile. So it's a bas basically a Bluetooth serial adapter. All right. So, 
I guess the next thing I will show you actually is the robot. Robot, because that's what you came to see, right? All right. Helps if I turn it on first. All right, I got it plugged in, got it turned on. Blinking light. Blinking light. Solid light. All right. The light went solid. Let me. DOE bot. This is the Board of Education bot, which is a specific robot that you can buy. All right. So I have the BOE bot. So on the right side of the screen, you'll see the BOE bot. On the left side, you'll see my code. And I have a JavaScript REPL environment, run, evaluate, print loop. So I can say bot, move forward. It's moving pretty slowly. Bot dot move forward at a faster speed. Bot dot stop before you run off the table. <laughs> bot dot spin left, and let's do a fairly good speed again. Bot dot stop. Bot dot forward, we'll go slightly slower, bot dot stop, bot dot spin right. Of course I can go backward as well. Well, I guess spin right didn't want to take. Oh, it's just very slowly, okay, spin right. I gotta go faster. There we go, now I'm spinning right. So all of this is being done, oops, bot dot stop. All of this is being done through JavaScript again. So this REPLBOT little program here, I call it a REPLBOT because it's a REPL command line, run, evaluate, print loop, and it's my robot. So I'm using this little Node.js library that I wrote called BOEBOT, and the BOEBOT is controlling the, um, the actual robot there. So when I open up the BOEBOT, it's a pretty simple file, but dealing with servo motors, which is what are inside of the, uh, the bot, tends to be a little obnoxious at times. You gotta send all kinds of fun commands to it. But underneath of this thing, we can see that I do have these two servo motors. A servo motor typically has a set of angles that it can go to and from. This is a continuous servo motor, which means it can continuously spin round and round and round and round in circles, kind of like you know a standard motor or engine would, except a servo motor allows you to uh, control a little more fine grain how fast it goes, and it adds that nice little sound to it as the servo is actually spinning. So using servo motors, the uh, BOE bot sets these up as continuous servo motors, and allows me to say left motor, right motor. And when I have, and I have this set speed where I can tell the left and right to set at a specific speed. And I use that set speed inside of other controls like forward. For forward, I want to take the speed, you know, 10 or 20 or whatever it is, and I'm going to convert that into uh, uh, specific values to go along with um, the, the set speed function down here. I'm not really going to bore you with all the details of why I'm doing all of this logic, uh, but it'll, it allows me to have you know, a single speed that I set or a left and a right speed that I set. And having a left and right speed that I set allows me to say set speed left and right where I want to turn left or turn right or spin left and spin right. So it gives me a little flexibility to be able to do that. So when I'm setting the speed, I'm setting the, how quickly the servo motors are turning, and that actually drives the robot. But driving the robot from a command line isn't always the most interesting thing to do. What gets more interesting is trying to quit Vim. <laughs> how do you generate a truly random string? Get a new Vim user to try and quit. <laughs> What gets more interesting than that, than using the command line, is when we do something like my xbot. All right, for this, uh, okay, I can unplug my barbecue thermometer. I have a USB xbox controller. There is a node library 
for the Xbox controller that allows me to have complete control using the Xbox controller. So I'm going to take both the BLE bot and the Xbox controller and I am going to run and wait for it to connect and it breaks. This Bluetooth connection is not always the most stable. There it goes. All right. So watch this on the right side of the screen. I'm going to use the D-pad over here and drive the robot around using an Xbox controller. And it's doing it wirelessly across that Bluetooth serial connection. This might not look like much when you see this running around the table, but just think about for a second the fact that this is a JavaScript powered robot. I mean, it's pretty amazing when you think about that. Ten years ago, five years ago, it's, I mean, that would have been science fiction talking, having JavaScript driving a robot around the table. It's just amazing what we can do these days to have JavaScript powering all of this. And we can see when I close out the Xbox controller and look at the code, we have this Xbox controller being required from Node.js and NPM. And all I'm doing here is setting up a new Xbox controller and looking for the left joystick being moved. I'm taking the position there, I'm doing some scales to get things scaled down so it, because it generates a really big number. And I'm just turning all of the information from the vector of that joystick into left and right speeds, which I then tell the robot what to do with. Bot forward, bot stop. It allows me to stop the robot or drive the robot forward and backward based upon the calculations that I've done. So all of this again, including the, the joystick control, is happening inside of JavaScript connected to Johnny5 here. So there's one more very interesting thing that we can do with this. And that is a leap motion. So I have right here, you can see on the right side of the screen, a leap motion device. This is a motion tracking device. It's pretty slick in that it'll actually track all five of your fingers and rotation of your wrist and hand and you can do all kinds of interesting things with this. So I've got the leap motion configured. Once I plug it in here. Plug this in through USB. Connect it to both the BOE box and the Leap Motion device. I'm going to move my webcam over. I'm going to open up this simple little web page that I have. And an interesting thing about this web page is the, the web page itself has to be focused in order for the Leap Bot to take commands. If it's not focused, I can't do anything. The web page isn't focused. So I have to focus over here onto this, and then I can start doing things. I can stop the bot, I can start the bot, I can make it spin around in circles, stop the bot again, make it spin the other way, a little bit faster. The gestures are not terribly intuitive. But here we have forward, backward, spin. So using motion control, we can tell the BOE bot to do things. And again, this is all JavaScript. If we look at the code here, what I have is the leap controller running in my browser, not inside of Node.js in this case. So the leap controller is actually uh, running in my browser and using all of the different gestures and everything that I have set up to send commands uh, 
through an AJAX request back to my web server, which is running Express.js and Node.js. Express and Node have the connection to the BOE bot over Bluetooth, and they forward the commands on over to the BOE bot. So top to bottom, this is almost entirely JavaScript. I'm running JavaScript in the browser to get the Leap Motion device to recognize the gestures, sending a JSON document back to a JavaScript API running Node.js, which then forwards the commands through Johnny5 using the serial port over to the BOE bot. So it's top to bottom, end to end JavaScript other than the C code running inside of the BOE bot for the standard Fermata firmware. So this is a short list of things that you can do with Johnny5 and electronics and basic design here. There's a lot more that you can actually do with the Arduino and the JavaScript though, including a newer system called Tesla.io, which is a set of hardware that runs JavaScript directly. It's not Node.js, it's not full-scale browser JavaScript, but it allows you to actually have JavaScript sent to the board, and the board runs the JavaScript through its own onboard interpreter in order to make things work. I don't personally have a Tesla device yet, but later on, uh, Cassandra Perch does, and I believe she'll be showing the Tesla device. So you guys would definitely want to check that out. And at that point, I'm open for questions. Uh, I think we have about 10 minutes if anybody has any questions. Yes, back there. The uh, speed of the leap, leap motion thing, uh -huh. how quickly you moved your hand? Yeah, the speed of the leap motion gestures uh, was directly uh, correlated to how fast I moved my hand. If I spin my hand slowly in a circle, it'll spin slowly. If I spin it really fast, then it'll spin faster. Awesome. Yeah, so that's, and then that's entirely the leap motion giving me that kind of control. In the, in the motion de sensing devices. Over there. Does Johnny 5 use uh, JSON as the format on the wire, or what does the format on the wire look like? Uh, does Johnny 5 use JSON on the wire in communicating? No, it does not. It uses that standard Fermata protocol. So it's, it is uh, raw serial communications. If you had a serial inspector, you would see AT commands and other serial commands running across the actual wire there. Any other questions? Yes. Have you found a, a decent client-side library for Xbox controllers so for, to run in the browser rather than in the uh, uh, have I found a decent client-side browser library for the Xbox controller? I haven't looked, honestly. I would wonder if the same library that I'm using could be used in a browser. Uh, you would need to use something like Browserify, which will take a Node.js NPM library and compile it so that it can be used, or wrap it, I guess, so that it can be used in a browser. Uh, but it's, it's not something that I've tried to do. I, I probably should try to do that. It'd be kind of fun to have a controller in the, in the browser directly. Because, I mean, I, I guess I've seen games, you know, game demonstrations where people are playing a game in a browser, so it must be possible. It's just a question of finding the right library. Okay, so Firefox has gamepad support. So you'd be able to plug it in and, and right, configure it and do all that. I haven't checked in about a year. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much. Um, if anybody wants to get in contact with me for any reason, here's some info about me, about the things that I do, and how to get in touch. You can find me at DerekBailey.com, which will be the easiest way to get all of the information that you want. And once this video is posted online, I will certainly have a blog post and have links to resources where you can find all of these things and get yourself started. Thank you.